Let's um, open our Bibles to Daniel 5. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 31 in Lesson 7 today. Last week in Chapter 4 of Daniel, God gave Daniel the interpretation to the king's second dream, which actually supported the first dream as it relates to prophecy. The first dream was the big picture of all the empires. You'll remember all the different empires that it represented. And then the second dream narrowed it down to the king himself. But ultimately, both dreams pointed to the fact that not only would the Babylonian empire be conquered, but it also showed that it's God who raises up and God who takes down and it's all according to his time. Well, then, following the second interpretation, Daniel gave the king great advice. He told him to repent. In other words, humble yourself, King Nebuchadnezzar. But unfortunately, he continued in his pride. And that's when we see the long suffering of God because it took him 12 months before suddenly, in a moment of time, God stripped him of his dignity, caused him to crawl around like a beast in the field for up to seven years, possibly, or until he came to his senses and humbled himself. And that's when God restored him, adding great majesty to his kingdom. Man, humility goes so much further than pride. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, last week we saw a glimpse of how great Babylon was, the actual city. It was an extravagant kingdom at the time it was destroyed. Its opulence surpassed that of any city of the known world. And remember, when King Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem, he not only took Daniel and his companions, but he also, according to 2 Kings 24, 13, carried all the treasures of the house of the Lord, including the vessels from Solomon's temple. And you'll remember, history tells us, if they were ever attacked, they had enough supplies in their city of food and water and everything that they needed that would last them for 20 years. So not only did the city seem impenetrable, but it, with its outer walls being tall and thick, we looked at that, and they had towers situated all the way around the top of the walls as lookouts, but also the inner walls. It was double-walled. It had eight massive gates, and while they weren't as thick as the outer, they were just as strong. So Babylon was home to the famous Tower of Babel, to the temple of the chief god Marduk, there were beautiful parks and gardens, as we saw last week at the at the top of the um, the hanging gardens was the Temple of Bell at the top. Um, you could see it from hundreds of miles away. There were idols and statues of gold, and it also had a well known library as well as one of the greatest armies of the world. We cannot even imagine the splendor of Babylon at this time, and Nebuchadnezzar as well as Belshazzar put their trust in the strength of the physical city and all the temporal riches that they had um, accumulated for themselves. And that always, always brings a false sense of security. And that's why Philippians 3.3 tells us that we are to worship the God in spirit and not put confidence in the flesh. Instead, we're to look at the things which are not seen, for the things which are not seen are eternal But the things which are seen, those tangible things, they're just temporary. They're going to be here today and gone tomorrow. So with that being said, we're to be aware of our surroundings until he comes. We are to occupy, the Bible tells us, but just not be preoccupied with the things of the world. In fact, 2 Timothy 2.4, Paul warns us, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this light that he may please him who and he who, him who enlisted him as a soldier in other words we don't engage in the warfare of this world we don't get involved with the entanglements of this life but we want to we want to keep our eyes focused on him and not look back we want to please god because he's the one that has enlisted us sometimes we forget that we are spiritual beings and we are just inhabiting these earthly, fleshly beings. Do we, isn't that true? We forget that we are eternal spirits. And it's just this flesh is just temporary. And the world and the flesh is passing away. And it can be gone in an instant. 
No one is promised tomorrow. And that's why God says in Jeremiah 17, 5, cursed is the man who trusts in or makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. But then he goes on down in verse 7 and said, but blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. What a beautiful picture he gives in that. Well, that brings us to chapter 5. For those who asked me for dates for the last couple of weeks, you can write these dates down, and hopefully it will help again. If you can go back and listen to the other overviews. But we know that in 562 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar died. He died of natural causes. And this means that he reigned a total of 43 years in Babylon from 605 to 562 BC. Then... Between chapters 4 and 5, there was about 23 years that have passed, during which time there were five kings. And that brings us to Belshazzar, who was the final king of the Babylonian Empire. He reigned from 556 to 539 BC until it was taken over by Cyrus, the king of the Medo-Persians. Well, last week we saw that it was all about Nebuchadnezzar. But this week, it's all about Belshazzar. And in chapter 5, we see five things regarding King Belshazzar. Number one, in verses 1 through 4, we see his lack of respect for the things of God. In verse 1, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine... Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels, which his father, now this word father is not Abba. It, it, it's, not, it, it's not the word for daddy. Um, it's probably speaking of a fourth father or some sort of lineage of grandfather. So his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple. Now these were listed back in chapter one when he took the first waves of cap, first wave of captivity when he brought Daniel and his three friends. He also brought the vessels from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, concubines might drink from them. So they brought the gold vessels, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. If you will, turn over to 2 Timothy, because as King Nebuchadnezzar had taken the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem, they had been preserved, even in this pagan kingdom, for five generations, five different kings. But here, Belshazzar uses them to worship and praise his pagan gods. He desecrates them, not only showing a lack of respect, not only a lack of fear, but also a digression in the leadership of Babylon. And we can't miss the application for us today, for our own lives, as we too are the vessels of God. In fact, in 2 Timothy 2.20, it tells us that in a great house, there are not only vessels of, of gold and silver, but also wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a vessel of honor, prepared as a useful vessel for God. And, and we have to make that choice to cleanse ourselves, to come to God in humility in order for that to happen. And we've seen this thread throughout the book so far, because like Daniel, we as believers are to be that vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for his glory. And positionally, we are. That's the good news. When we come to Jesus Christ for salvation, it says that we are justified. We have been justified. But practically, on day-to-day -day living, as we choose daily to abide under his influence, we can become useful for his glory. And that's what we see with Daniel throughout the book. Well, back to Daniel 5.5, 5, we see number two, that God has a message for Belshazzar. Verse five, 
In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of a king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed and his thoughts troubled him so that his, the joints of his hips were loosed or literally dissolved, referring to diarrhea. And his knees knocked against each other. And the king cried aloud, to bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, or the wise men of the world, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a gold chain around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Wow. Tough king here. He's so troubled that he loses it literally. He has diarrhea, messes all over himself. His knees are knocking and he cries out. And then Belshazzar offers Daniel a position third in the kingdom. Now, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, who offered him second in the kingdom, but it was most likely because Belshazzar was co-reigning with his as the second king, because his father, Nebulun, was ruling in Arabia at the time. So the best he could offer Daniel was third in the kingdom. And then verse eight, now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled and his countenance was changed and his lords were astonished or literally perplexed. So here again, we see all the wisdom of the world that was at his disposal was nothing when it came to spiritual matters. Just as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.14 that the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And boy, do we see that being played out in our world today, proving that mere intellect will never properly give us real insight into the Word of God. We can gain a lot of information but it's the spirit that teaches, teaches us as, as, as deep cries out to deep. And so we need his spirit to reveal that godly wisdom and discernment to each one of us. Just as John 14, 26 tells us that it's his spirit that teaches us all things and brings to our remembrance all the things which he has given to us. So any spiritual understanding is simply a work of the Spirit. And that's what the wise men were missing and why they were no help to Belshazzar. Well, then number three, in Daniel 5.10, we see that Belshazzar gets advice. In, in verse 10, the queen, most likely his mother, so mother queen, mommy queen, because of the words of the king and his lords came to the banquet hall. And the king spoke and said, oh, the queen spoke and said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor your countenance change. In other words, oh, come on, son, stand up and act like a man. <laughs> Don't be bothered by this. Because she explains in verse 11, there's a man in your kingdom who is this, is, who, in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, or your grandfather, the king made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas were found in this dance. Daniel. Wow, what a list of, of <laughs> that would, that's amazing. Wouldn't that be so cool to be described that way? But whom the, the king named Belshazzar, now let Daniel be called and he will give the interpretation. She had complete, absolute confidence that Daniel would be able to give the interpretation. This queen mom, she knew and she's telling her son, don't be all freaked out. Don't go to the wisdom of the world because this guy over here, he's got the spirit of God in him. So with complete conf uh, confidence, she advises him to call Daniel. Why? Because of Daniel's testimony, because of his reputation, because of the life that he lived while he was in this pagan kingdom. And what a lesson for all of us. 
You see, it's not how we start, but it's how we finish. And so everyone knew that the spirit of the holy God was in Daniel. And that really blessed me because it means that Daniel was known for his consistency and his faithfulness to God. He had a solid reputation. And it all goes back to chapter one. It's because when he arrived in Babylon, he purposed in his heart to not defile himself. He purposed in his heart, he made the choice to be set apart and not compromise physically or spiritually. And what an example for us, because Daniel's about 80 years old here, and still he's set apart being used for the glory of God. Isn't that amazing? So don't miss that because it was not, he was not out partying with the rest of them. His mind was clear, he was sober, and he was watchful and ready and prepared for God to use him. Just as Peter exhorts us in 1 Peter 2.11 when he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners, as pilgrims, to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works which they observe glorify God in the day of visitation. Now it's not that Daniel couldn't party because he was offered the wine and all the delicacies. And we've talked about that in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, where Paul says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Not all things are going to edify the people around you. And I will not be brought under the power of any. In other words, not all things prepare us to be a vessel of honor so that we can be used to the glory of of God. Clark and I went and did a, um, he did, he officiated a wedding in Arizona and it was, it was, you know, I don't get out much obviously, but it was amazing. I was telling the leaders this morning, I was in the bathroom and you know, it's an open bar and everything. And you guys know we don't drink at all. So it was, it's not a big deal, but it was, it was just fun to sit there and watch. Well, it wasn't fun. It was sad sad to watch these people because, I mean, even coming down to the wedding, they all had drinks in their hands. It was, it was like I was in an alternate universe. And I'm in the bathroom and this lady comes in and she tries to crawl into a, a locker and then just goes, I can't find the door. And I'm like, wow. It just made me think of the partying that Belshazzar was doing where they didn't know what side was up. And I felt like, oh, are you having fun yet? Because she couldn't even walk. I might, mean, what in the world, people? Be sober minded and just be prepared to see what God wants to do. I don't want to be caught in a state like that. Do you? So you got to make that choice to be set apart and not defile ourselves. Now, the question isn't, can I do those things? The question is, should I be partaking in those things? And if we have to ask, the, the answer is probably no. But I don't know about you. I want to purpose in my heart to be set apart for his glory. And it's not a one-time deal. It's not just as we walk into something and we think, oh, I'm going to be set apart. It's our lifestyle. It's, it's a choice that we make every moment. And Daniel shows that it's, just, it's not just how we start but it's how we finish. Well, then number four, it's the, it's the, we see the king's request at verse 13. It says, Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? And here his reputation is highlighted. As the king says, I've heard of you that the spirit of God is in you and that the light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now, the wise men, astrologers, have been brought before me, but they could not give the interpretation. And I've heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me that's interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck. Oh boy. I mean, <laughs> the guy doesn't get it. And you shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Again, 
the highest promotion that Belshazzar could give him. Then in Daniel 5, 17, we see number five, that Daniel gives the king an answer. In verse 17, Daniel answered, and he said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. I don't want your stuff. And you give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. In other words, Daniel couldn't be bought. He was just a servant of the most high God. And so his answer includes, number one, the refusal of payment. He knew his reward was in heaven. And then verses 18 through 21, he gives a history lesson as he answers him. In verse 18, O king, almost to say, don't you know that the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor? And because of the majesty that God gave him, all people's nations and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was disposed, deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. So just as Nebuchadnezzar's pride led to his downfall, Belshazzar's will also. Unfortunately, Belshazzar did not learn from history. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, now all these things happened to them, the children of Israel, as examples. They were written for our admonition on whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him th- who th- let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Speaking of pride, none of us stand on our own. We are all to be reliant upon the God of the universe. So it's interesting that it's estimated Belshazzar was approximately 14 years old when Nebuchadnezzar received his first dream of the prophecy of the downfall of Babylon. So evidently Belshazzar either forgot or he ignored the whole thing. It was Edmund Burke that said, those who do not know or ignore history are destined to repeat it. And how true that is that we're seeing played out in our day to day, amen? Look at verse 21, as Daniel continues to remind Belshazzar what happened. Verse 21, then Nebuchadnezzar was driven from the sons of men, his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was the was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all of this, and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. Never a good idea. They have brought the vessels of his house before you and you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which you do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Wow. What an indictment against this king. But then in verse 24, he continues, then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, from the God who holds his breath. And this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. Meanie, meanie, tekel, eupharsin. That is the weirdest group of words. It's Aramaic, right? So this all ties together as the interpretation points back to the dream that that God gave King Nebuchadnezzar. And now we're finally seeing the fulfillment. And in verse 26, it explains, this is the interpretation of each word, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. The time has come. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting, or you've been found deficient. And then Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then, verse 29, Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a gold chain around his neck and made him 
proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. So Belshazzar thought somehow it would be all okay if he just promoted Daniel and, 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 and everything would just be fine and that this would not come true. But he completely missed the point because he thought he could buy that favor and it didn't work because God doesn't look at our bank accounts. Have you ever noticed that? He doesn't look at our financial statements or where we live or how many things we have or our jewelry box. In fact, there's nothing we can do to win favor with God. The only way to heaven is to humbly admit that we are nothing. We are sinners in need of a savior and acknowledge that he is everything, that he is the one that we need. He's our savior, causing us to rely upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. That it's better to be of humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. In other words, God will deal with pride, but he will always give grace to the humble. And here, here we see the handwriting or the judgment is on the wall for those who ignore God's word. But for you and I as believers, we don't have to wait for God's judgment to be revealed through some mysterious sign because we have his truth. We have his written word and it foretells that his coming will put an end to pride. John 17, 17 tells us that his word is truth. And I love where Peter asked in John six sixty eight. he says, oh Lord, where should we go? For you alone have the words of eternal life. Like there's no better place to be than in the word of God, in the safety of his spirit. So not only can we turn to his word for eternal life, but he's also given us his spirit to understand it. God's so good to us, isn't he? He hasn't left us as orphans or to wander around like blind, trying to find our way. But his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Turn over to Isaiah 45, if you will, because you guys all know the story that when Cyrus came to Babylon, he found the city impenetrable. But as he discovered an old riverbed, he first divided the troops into three groups. Then he dug out the old riverbed and built a dam to divert the water. Then he placed the troops at the entrance and the exit of the river at the city walls. And as Belshazzar used the sacred vessels to be praising his pagan gods, partying, the priests of Marduk were very angry with Belshazzar because the god of Marduk was supposed to be the chief god whom they worshipped with those vessels. And because the priests were angry at Belshazzar, they actually helped the Medo-Persian army conquer Babylon. And as Belshazzar thought Cyrus has withdrew his troops, he went ahead with the party. He knew they were out there, but he didn't think they were any threat because his self-sufficiency was so big in his pride. And so on the very night of his party, when everyone was drunk... On October 12, 539 BC, God's prophecy was fulfilled. It was at about midnight when it says that the water levels of the Euphrates River dropped to the height of the men's thighs. Cyrus marched his army into Babylon, Babylon through open gates, and he captured the city without even a fight. And that's when he proclaimed himself to be king of Babylon. In fact, The men of Babylon with Belshazzar were so drunk, they didn't even know that the city had been conquered for days. Isn't that amazing? No wonder God tells us to be sober and to watch and to be alert. Just as God said, listen to Isaiah 45, picking up in verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings to open before him the double doors 
so the gates will not be shut. Speaking of Babylon, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places that you may know that I, the Lord who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. Isn't that amazing? So all this to say that the word of God predicts the fall of Babylon with 100% accuracy, even down to the very day. And the sad thing is Isaiah prophesied a hundred years before. And Belshazzar heard Daniel's prophecies, but he did not heed the word of God even though it matched. And so that is a wake-up call for us because just as 2 Peter 2.19 tells us that we've been given a more sure word of his prophecy, we have a choice to make. We know the handwriting is on the wall. We've got prophecy. We see it being fulfilled all around us at an exceeding rate. Who would have thought 20 years ago the deception that has hit our country or this world would be as rampant as it is? We couldn't understand how people could be so deceived. And look what's happening today. Things are ramping up. Jesus is coming just as he said. We have the more sure word of prophecy. So we have a choice to make. We can take heed to that prophecy and look up and stay alert and be sober and watchful, or we can just ignore it and seal our fate. Even today, that handwriting is on the wall. The question is, are we ready or are we distracted with the pleasures of the world and the false security that, like Belshazzar had? Unfortunately, too many people think we've got plenty of time. But remember, Second Peter 3, 8 and 9 tells us, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. Ladies, time is imminent. Just as a woman knows she's going to give birth at the end of nine months, it's going to happen. Jesus is coming. It's going to happen because God's word says so. And we've talked about it in previous studies that we need to be careful not to make the mistake of thinking that God's long suffering is an approval for living in the world. He is so patient in his love, but we can know because he is also a judge that payday will be one day, and it's coming soon. Well, back to Daniel 5, where we see God's word is sure. And by the time Belshazzar could call for help, it was too late. Verse 30, it says that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. And Cyrus the Mede received the kingdoms just as God said about, at about 62 years old. So the main point of our study is that all, every human being will be weighed in the balance. There will be a day that we stand before God and all our days are numbered. In other words, God knows when that day will be. We don't, but God does. So the choice is ours. We can stand on our own merits and our own goodness, counting on the slackness of his coming as approval, or we can humbly stand in his righteousness according to his standard, to be a vessel of honor. And again, the real question is, are we ready? Are we devoted like Daniel? Have we determined or purposed in our heart to be those vessels of honor for his glory? 1 Thessalonians 5.2 says, You yourself know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them. Wow, what a picture of Belshazzar. Bash- <laughs> blah, 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 blah. <laughs> what a picture of Belshazzar. Verse 4, but you, brethren, are not in darkness so that the day should overtake you as a thief. Therefore, let us not be, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. So we are to watch for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I say he's coming back soon, but yet I say he's not coming back soon. He's on his way. Amen? He is coming. And I'm so blessed to be a part of a group of women who who are ready for his coming, who are occupying until he comes, as you are in his word being diligent to look 
to him for your safety and your protection. God is so good. And so, Lord, I just thank you so much for these ladies. I pray that you would just pour out your spirit in these last days, Lord, that you would use each and every one of us as we keep our hearts and our minds focused upon you. For, Lord, you are alone who we go to for the answers. For, Lord, you are our high tower. You are our shelter. You are our buckler, Lord. You are where we go when we need to find safety. You are the rock that is higher than I when our heart is overwhelmed. And so, God, we thank you so much that we can hide in the shelter of your wings, that you, like a a mother hen, just bring us in close to your bosom, and you shelter us, Lord. And so, Father, that's where we want to be, but then we want to take that out to a lost and dying world to share the hope that we have that only comes through Jesus. For Lord, our, the handwriting is on the wall. Our days are numbered. And so Lord, we say, Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. And it's in Jesus Christ's most precious name. And all God's ladies say, amen.